There are three wonderful people here, Kath Murdoch, Matt Glover, and Kathy Collins. One, all my all my favorite people. So I'm, now we all should look forward to this conversation and I'll hand this over to Kathy. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hey, Matt and Kath, it's so nice to be here with you. And I don't mean to tell our secrets, but I look forward to continuing our conversation about our dream school. <laughs> after after the dog talk, then we can have the school talk. But um, I'm so excited. Uh, I don't know. I'm not quite sure in the world if any if when is the book coming out? Just a very quick question. When when um, will people? It, be able to... it it is out. Basically. Okay, it is okay. So people can I and I'm wondering if people in the in the um, participants have been able to see it. I had the pleasure mm -hmm. of. Um, seeing it and it's beautiful. So we'll, I'll start with that, um, The Wonder of Winsome. And I just have a, a question to start. I, you know, thinking about um, origin stories, you know, what, what, what is the book about and what, how did it start, uh, you know, from, from idea to book, you know, just can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the beginnings? And yeah, sure. And thank you, Kathy, for saying that lovely thing about the book. I'm glad that the the money that I sent obviously got through to you. So fantastic. That's great. <laughs> um, so, and look, I think talking about origin stories when it comes to, to books is really important also for us as teachers of writing with, with children. And one thing I want to say straight up to everybody that's that's listening is that I see um, tonight's conversation as an opportunity, sure, to talk about this book, but, but actually to talk about how it has got me thinking even more about the teaching of writing with our children and, uh, and of course, to draw on these two amazing educators, uh, Kathy and Matt, when it comes to uh, what we do around writing in schools. So in terms of the origin story of this book, this um, uh, it's been a long time coming. I think the idea came to me about probably about two and a half years ago when I think about it. I think Winsome's probably been sitting in the back of my mind for a while, but um, I was on a rare vacation, actually, on a rare holiday, and um, the idea... It, she just came to me, you know, and I know that sounds a bit weird and cheesy and corny, but I think sometimes um, creative projects happen like that, that they find you and they tend to find you when you're not busy and distracted with a whole lot of other things. So I think even that moment, even that has implications for what we do with children in terms of the busyness and the intensity of classroom life. If we want ideas to come to us, we actually need some space often for those ideas to, to find us. Um, but yeah, so she came to me and and um, I just felt like I needed to, to write her down. And um, I love writing and I always have. So it was a really fun kind of exercise in creativity for me. Um, and of course, the as it was emerging, I realised that it was really just another way of expressing the work that I do with teachers about inquiry-based learning. So it was a story, it was a narrative, but it was, yeah, a, a different way of, of doing what I'm doing. So it felt like something important to keep going with. Um, it wasn't without its hiccups. It wasn't without its times where I thought, I don't want to do it anymore. Um, and I guess that too was really interesting for me because I cared about it a lot. And I think because I really cared about my topic, it helped me push through the challenging times. And that in itself made me think often about what must it be like? Well, I know what it's like. I experienced it at school myself. But to be told you have to write about something that you don't care about at all. I, oh, so yeah. Oh, Kath, could you just repeat that little last bit? You froze for a second. You said mm. you, it 
froze when you were saying you remember what it was like when you were in school and you had to write about things you didn't care about and then you mm -hmm. went on and you just missed the rest oh, of that just saying that that you know even writing about something that meant a lot to me and that I was really invested in there were still those times where I absolutely felt like oh it's too hard or where I lost motivation and that's when I cared about it so it, it just got me thinking again about what we ask kids to do when we tell them what they have to write about um, and we expect them to stay motivated to do it. It, you, it, it. Yeah. This the Just the different points of vulnerability, like the, the fragility yeah. of an initial idea and then the vulnerability of sustaining. When, you Absolutely. Know, Absolutely. And you you two know this, even writing for, for teachers, right? I mean, we've all written several books between us. And, and I think, you know, that rush of inspiration, like, yes, I, I, I'm so excited about this project. And I've got this great idea, and I can see what it's going to look like. And then the reality of the inevitable hard slog of actually doing it. And I don't know about you, but I feel like every time I've written a book for teachers, um, I get to the end of it and I think it's a bit like childbirth. It's just like, uh, that's it. I am not doing that again. Sorry, Matt, but I'm just take our word for it. Like, that's, yeah. I'm not. And then like childbirth, you forget the pain and go, oh, I want to do it again. So I, I just kept thinking about that in terms of kids, that that same feeling of I've got a great idea. And then what sort of support our young writers need when that great idea that they had doesn't necessarily land the way they think it's going to when that pencil hits the paper or when their fingers hit the keyboard. Yes. And I always have such a great admiration for people that can um, write for children as well as write for adults. I think that's very different. Um, at least I hope it's very different because I, that's daunting to me. I, um, as much as I've written for teachers, the thought of, um, writing for children is something that um, I haven't done or I haven't um, really thought about. And I really admire people that can do both. And so I'm wondering just how the actual writing process was different there. Um, and thinking about that, you know, your own process, mm -hmm. how was that, or was it different in writing for children? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A lot different, a lot different, I think. Um, so I have had a little bit of practice. So back in Gosh, in the late 80s and early 90s, I was asked to write um, several books for a couple of reading series um, here in Australia that were, they were called reading series back then. But they, uh, they were series that had a lot of integrity. They, were, they wanted to create books for children that were, you know, high quality, good quality um, uh, writing. So... That was my first foray into it. So mm -hmm. I've done it, I've done a bit there, but it had been a long time. But I think one of the the key differences is is that you, I'm sure you you've heard this and you and you would know it that in many ways when when you are limited by when when brevity is the order of the day, every word as is high stakes heavy words so the crafting of a sentence can take so long and and it I, it's more like writing I feel like it's more like writing poetry which I, I used to do a lot of too I feel like writing for children feels more like writing a poem than writing for grown-ups and the other thing of course is when I'm writing for teachers I'm I'm it's exposition it's explanation this is a narrative and um, actually is kind of the first time I've done this so that's that's different too and and again that made me think about how much do we have these conversations with children mm -hmm. about the demands of you know a, a limited text and the the crafting of that and the 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 very different experience of writing a story compared to writing a set of instructions or a persuasive right. piece um, and writing a story I think there's such you're so invested in it 
So I feel like writing this, not just because it was for children, but also because it was a story and it had a character and a character that I started to really love that I felt really um, protective. And then when you feel protective of your writing, the challenge is when someone gives you feedback about a part of it that they don't think works so well, your inclination is to go, but no, yes, it does. So again, just the conferring with children um, piece that I'm so used to doing and I love, I think I've got a renewed um, empathy for what happens for children when we point something out in their writing yeah. that might not quite work for us. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here and jotting down all the different little connections and words that you're saying to, again, the thinking of teaching of writing. Um, and so I've got a bunch of them now. One of them that I wonder about that I hadn't even thought about this um, in connection to this, but um, mm. so I made a conversation um, just a week ago with um, with my friend Katie Wood Ray, who's just mm. you know, I owe everything to in terms of teaching yes. writing. But yes, was interesting. We were having this conversation. Well, there's having this conversation about um, that fact that when children ask, older children ask, how many words does this need to be? That sometimes <gasps> um, seen yeah. as a negative question, right? Mm. Because we, oh, just write however long. Does but that's not what actually people do in the world. People actually write towards length when they have a vision for what they're going to make. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about is the, in many ways, the word um, word count kind of thing, right? We've yeah. all dealt with that in terms of what's the word count of our professional book, what's the word count, what, how many pages is this going to be? The fact that you're yeah. making a picture book being very different than mm -hmm. writing something else. And so I think what that really speaks to is the, um, the importance of vision for children. Are they making something? Do they know a yeah. Do they have a scope yeah. of what this thing is? Um, yeah. And a vision for that, as opposed to, well, no, I'm just writing to write. And actually, when people are making something, they do have a, a vision for it in mind about how long is this thing going to be, right? Mm. And so it's mm -hmm. interesting to hear you talk about um, really being conscious of brevity and word choice, but because that's very different if you're writing something else. Oh. And so different you know I mean you can't possibly in books that I've written for teachers I can't agonize over every single word mm. um I think I think I would encourage every teacher to try and write a, a story for children even if the audience is simply the the class that they've got because the process of doing it and the process of um right. thinking about every word that way gives you such a respect, a, a new respect for language and a new, I mean, I, I'm, I've got a, I love words um, and I had some really delightful inquiry moments in thinking about the language or the punctuation even in, in the book. Um, uh, my, my friend Shaz Bailey that some of you uh, here will, will mm -hmm. know, uh, she she and I had the most fantastic e inquiry into ellipses because so, she was one of the people that that read read it fairly late on actually, and um, and just our questions about so do you have a space between the end of the word and the beginning of the ellipsis? Do you when does that cat with and just this lovely yeah. opportunity then to go to all your mentor texts and actually look at okay what have other authors done? So I was doing. Yeah we were doing exactly what we want our kids to do and rather than having the teacher say we're going to do a little lesson on this aspect of punctuation it's like in that moment this is where I need to understand how does this work yeah it's so funny you mentioned that once like we planned this we, I was we had that conversation with students the other day and in fact we oh, came really? across an, well we came across an ellipsis followed by a period. So it looks like a four dot ellipsis. Mm -hmm. This class had this really interesting um, theories about whether it was just an extra long pause because there were four dots there as an ellipsis or was it an ellipsis followed by a period <laughs> or, was it a, or was it a period followed by an ellipsis, right? It was a right. fascinating discussion. Yeah, and it wasn't so who much, knew? <laughs> right, and there wasn't so much that there's, a, there's an answer to it, but that's not really the point at all, is thinking about, okay, no. what's my intent for my reader? What do, I, what do I want this to sound? And what am I going to do on the page to communicate yeah. that in that way? You know, yeah. and as you say, and as you talk about, you know, everyone should really try writing for children. One of the ways to look at that is you don't have to write for children in the hopes of publishing it. 
But really, what's the alternative to, what's the alternative? You almost, not almost, you have to write stories if we're gonna teach children how to write stories or any type of writing, because mm -hmm. we have to understand what children are going through, right? What children yes. are doing. It's very difficult to teach students to do something that we've never done. And really, if you think about it, that doesn't happen anywhere else in school other than writing, yeah. right? Writing's the only area yeah. where people will say, you know, like for example, no one ever goes into a math class and says, today I'm gonna teach you how to divide um, fractions. Never done it myself, but I understand this is how it works. <laughs> No one yeah. ever does that, but people yeah. go into classrooms all the time and ask, I'm going to teach students to write poetry who have never having written poems themselves, or I'm going to write, teach you how to write stories, but I haven't tried to write one myself. We have to, I didn't say I have to write good ones, but we have to go through that process to understand mm -hmm. the process that children are, under, are undergoing. So yeah, I think yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be published out in the world, but you certainly have to no. go through that process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. I I just uh, I'm in all of this. I'm still th thinking about that idea of word count and word choice and how they're tied together. And mm -hmm. so often, um, when when kids are approaching revision, it's about adding, uh, being additive, yeah. and thinking like that perception of quantity equals quality sometimes. Or yeah. this is what the teacher wants more detail or more into, um, and I don't know if writing in a word count, you know, for example, um, submitting proposals that have a word mm. count. And there's something so exhilarating about getting to, <laughs> I need 450 words and I have 462. And the way you look at your writing, yes. when you're trying, it's, it's almost, it's one of my favorite things. Although Matt, I know I write really long. I, I, I oh, you're not the same. Yeah, Edward sits their hands on my on everything. But um, <laughs> there was one. It's interesting you said that. So like just the, the reading side of that, like a reading, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. a negative. I don't mean mm -hmm. negative, uh, pro con negative, but like a photograph negative. The reading side of this is one of the things that I teach when I'm working with readers is to that idea of paying such, you know, close reading comes up, you know, and um, reading mm. closely. And I, I would describe it like um, we want readers to pay attention. It's like if you're, um, one way to think about it, I'll say to teachers, if you're, um, or kids, if you're walking on a wood floor with socks, there's a little nail or something, and it just catches you, like really paying attention when you're mm. reading to a word or phrase that like, mm. What's a skip in your step of you reading? I can't, I I can't quite um, articulate it really well. But there was one sentence that just I I wrote it down like three times that I just really appreciated and really, uh, and it's such a simple little um, little word. So you said um, there was just so much to wonder about in Winsome's world, and mm. just that the putting to wonder versus there was so much wonder in Winsome's mm. world that that putting to wonder is it's active you know wonders all around us mm. but we it's it's an active state to wonder and kids mm -hmm. bring that active state in how Winsome brought her questions to school and mm -hmm. so I just I'm wondering if um you know, thinking about the rush of a teacher's school day, the pressures on a school year to get this done, get this done, jump through this hoop, yeah. jump through that hoop. Um, and I think, you know, given that we're in an inter most, if not all of the teachers here, well, I know not all of them, but most of the teachers might work in international schools, which have such a, um, uh, there's beautiful claims on their time and that there's, you know, they have beautiful specials. And um, so sometimes teachers, don't have much time to do all the things they need to do. So what what would you say? How do we help teachers mm. attend to the questions and the that to wonder, the active wondering, mm -hmm. um, given all the, you know, what's that like for a teacher? What would you say? Ooh, well, I mean, I mean that's, and Winsome's teacher gives us a good example. So thank you for that. <laughs> he does. It's, you know, it's interesting when the earlier drafts of the story, I think, I mean, we in the story, uh, you know, spoiler alert, 
um, Winsome's teacher does have an epiphany, but early on in the story, she doesn't really notice um, Winsome's questions. And in fact, very quickly, Winsome becomes a little bit embarrassed by her questions. She, for those of you that don't know it, the, um, in the story, the questions are like little words, they're almost characters in themselves. They're her little friends. And she proudly brings them to school on her first day. I've got all these questions. And then um, soon realizes the questions don't quite belong at school and it's a little bit awkward. So tries to hide them and sticks them under a hat and tucks them up her sleeve and then eventually leaves, leaves them at home. Um, and then the teacher does kind of see the proverbial light a, li a little later on. Um, and, and the teacher sees that because she takes, she has this moment where she literally sees Winsome and metaphorically sees Winsome. So she notices something. And I think one of the ways perhaps that for all of us as, as teachers, and this is whether we're working with teachers, whether we're working with children, anybody who's in that role of the educator, I think making a commitment to do what we can to see the individuals that with whom we are working. Um, I think there is no greater, um, you know, no, no, nothing of greater importance to me, you know, when I think about it with my parent hat on, as, as well as my teacher hat on, that our children need to be and feel seen. And that includes seeing what, what is it that I'm noticing about you? What is it that, what are you curious about? What's the thing that lights up your face when I speak to you? And we've all been in those situations where you're conferring. I'm often conferring with kids about their personal inquiry projects. So I'm often asking them, okay, so tell me a little more about that video game and thinking Ugh, until I find this moment where there's something and their face lights up. And it's like, there we are. That's it. That's the thing. Yeah. That's the seed we're going to use. And that's the seed that we can grow into a project or a piece of writing. So how do we, I think maybe if teachers themselves feel seen by the leaders in their schools, maybe that translates then to them taking the time to see their their learners and just to have those really, 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 really important one-to-one -one conversations, particularly early in the year. I know that there are a lot of teachers with us right now um, on the other side of the world, on your side of the world that are coming to the end of their school year or have, I don't know, are they finished or soon to yeah, in the process? Some are finished. Yes. Yep. The, em the embers are dying anyway. And, um, and, and when you go into your new year, you know, that should be our first priority. And then I think once we do that, once we say, my priority is to really connect and know each child I'm working with, then so many other things fall into place that perhaps buy us time. You know, I just I went mean, on a rant, sorry. I no, I agree. No, it's so interesting. I'm jotting all sorts of things down. But that whole idea of really um, looking to see when children's eyes light up and something, I think about that all the time and helping children mm. find topics to write about and I always talk about the you know the best time to help children find writing topics is um you know not during a writing conference it's on the way to the playground and we're talking and, and just we're having natural conversations and we say oh you, know, you can yeah. write about that I'm gonna say as many times in a week as I can oh you could write about that because yeah. I'm looking for when when do children's eyes light up right when do you think oh yeah there's yeah. the topic that they're there it is interested in. yeah but that yeah. takes but that takes such an inquiry stance on the part of us as teachers we're sitting here talking all the yes. time about supporting children's inquiry but we really have to be approaching this from an inquiry standpoint that our job is um trying to discover in children right what are their interests what are their um what are they engaged in what's really going to be meaningful to them and it always makes you think yeah. about how often are we how often are we asking questions that we really don't know the answer to, right? As opposed to what often happens in schools, we're asking questions to elicit a certain response mm -hmm. as opposed to true research questions where we're really trying to figure something out. So I think so much of this is, has to be um, our ability to um, 
really approach children from that inquiry standpoint. Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, this is where it's no surprise that I have a passion for writing and a passion for reading and a passion for inquiry and that they all kind of meld. I actually started as a young teacher. My, I majored in children's literature and I, you know, literacy was my thing. And then I kind of moved into the world of, of inquiry-based learning. And I feel like now those two, those two ideas really that they're, they're inseparable and everything you just said about getting that sense of you know what what inspires children or, or what you see is inspiring them and then how that becomes something they could write about and that you've got to kind of catch that as you're engaging with them in conversation and so on that is exactly what I say about personal inquiry right that mm -hmm. It's not about, okay, kids, we're all going to do a passion project. What do you want to do a project on? It's much more saying you, you're going to have these opportunities throughout the year to investigate things that you find intriguing or interesting or challenging or, you know, or a problem you want to solve. So we need to start to notice when those moments come up and then we need to capture them, which is what a writer's notebook is for or what a researcher's notebook is for. And they become, in many cases, one in the same thing. I've had a few teachers say to me, look, the writer's notebook sort of got a bigger purpose now because it's, it is, we are kind of, planting the seeds for writing but some of these seeds also become a bigger journey of inquiry the kids are actually researching the thing that they are wanting to write about and then you get this really lovely kind of union of the writer's workshop with a personal inquiry workshop and um, and that that's when I think it gets really exciting because that's when your kids are actually beh behaving if you like as a real author does I mean you you research you, you you most authors do not just sit and say right I'm just going to write about this thing and here it is it's like I mean I've done so much research for this book because I use so many of the questions that she asks are questions that I've written down that kids have asked including my own I've got this treasure trove of questions so yeah. Yeah, that that to me, that relationship between being a researcher and being a writer, um, that I think we don't help kids see because they have this idea that research is this thing that you do when you Google stuff or you go to the library, rather than you are researching when you are out on a walk, you know, you're being a researcher as a, as a writer, as a scientist, as a geographer. It, you make me think so much about what we prioritize in our note taking about kids and conferences, reading conferences, mm. writing conferences, mm. and or even like faculty meetings or grade level meetings. You know, mm -hmm. when people have data team meetings and they're bringing cold hard data. What if a data team meeting was let's for next Tuesday let's bring all of the shenanigans and questions. That, you know, <laughs> And even that, like the, analyzing those, like where are questions coming from? What qu kinds of questions do they have? Mm -hmm. Do we see anything on this grade that people are really, this grade as a whole in this time? Uh, you know, there's so many teachers who, um, I mean, it's not accidental, but they're, they're finding their kids becoming junior epidemiologists because they have so many questions. Yes. And so just thinking about how a faculty might approach uh, meetings like what does it mean to be all business everyone wants to be all business use our time wisely but it's sometimes using our time wisely is speaking and thinking about kids not with what they produce you know mm -hmm. uh, standards wise or rubric wise or number wise but mm. who they are and what they're bringing to the classroom that's, yes it, it just makes yes. me think about note taking so much yeah I love the idea that you know, I mean, obviously it's it's a kind of almost a metaphor when Winsome brings her questions to school and, and in, in the book it's literally bringing her little wormy questions to school. But I love the idea that one of the first meetings we might have as a team would be to, I love that, bring the shenanigans to the meeting, you know, that that the, the data that we are gathering, our first and foremost data is... Um, 
what have we noticed that our children are interested in? Who are our children? Let's bring the data that we want that we're going to analyze at our first meeting is, you know, well, that might not necessarily be in the form of articulated questions, but what we have noticed about who these young people are that have come to our, our classroom. The, the quirk rubric. <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. See those things is so it makes teaching technicolor when you uh, you know and and four dimensional when you see kids that yes. way and not just what are they doing as writers what are they doing as readers what are mm. they doing as mathematicians mm -hmm. and how you can plug yeah. then some of the things that you are noticing so I'm, I'm actually thinking about some schools that I work with here and what we often do towards the end of each year is we do, we interview children, we gather their questions, we ask them what are the things that going into year three you would love to learn more about and we get all of that data and we bring it to a day and then we create mud maps of our big inquiry questions for the following year. And and I'm as I'm talking, I'm thinking, we really need to keep, we need to hold on to the things that the children have shared with us because they also can operate as things that might go into their writer's notebooks. And we often say to the kids, if you don't see the thing that you said, you really, really wanted to investigate. If you don't see it reflected in the big questions that we've developed, that is something that can still be a seed for your, your writing. Um, so I, I want to say just before we keep going that Every so often I'm seeing really interesting little things coming up in the chat. I don't have the chat open, but sometimes I'm so, I'm very aware that there's a, some rich conversation um, happening in the chat. I always feel like at this moment in a webinar, it's like that some people have, you know, they've been watching the band and it's like, yeah, and now they've got another drink and they've gone away over to a table over there to have a, a conversation which is great so so feel free if you don't want to watch the band anymore but you want to keep talking to each other you're more than welcome <laughs> well and just to give you a heads up Kath there have been um several requests in the chat already for um you to read the book and so I don't know we didn't really talk about whether you're planning on that but oh, I have, yes I bet yeah we haven't even shown so I think we need to save it just to plan ahead here we need to save a little time at the end for you to be able to read it if you don't mind I'll pull okay. it up on the screen so people can see it I've got the pdf right there and so if that's uh, all right okay just think I had about, not I know, thought about that but yes I, uh, yeah. I, I I know you had <laughs> so guess what I'll give you a little um time to think about it and you can always um change the subject and stall if you decide to start <laughs> throwing that out there so I don't well, suddenly go my internet's down I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. right, so I don't, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, exactly. That's the advantage. You know, you've got so our friend Shaz doesn't say, why didn't you ever read it, Matt? So we've um <laughs> I've got that out there for you, Shaz. Um okay. but you know, but but again, coming back to the book and thinking about it, I want about the book, I wonder how you see this book um being used in classrooms. Right? Mm. How do you see it being used with children? How do you see it being used with teachers? Um certainly as a parent, it's a um book that um i would love or love but it would certainly a book i would use in classrooms as well in fact it'd be really interesting when i think as we're talking about the beginning of a school year um mm -hmm. or helping think about um um our job of being to discover what um children's passions are how, how do you see this book being used um in classrooms mm. oh thank you i love that that question i'm i well i think i i have used it but not in its final, final form, but I. one of the things that I did through the process is I would share my, I had some um, children, um, for example, at one of my schools, Mother Teresa Primary School up the road here in Melbourne, and I took a very different version of it um, to a group of children there who gave me some feedback, and I've, I've read it on and off to children in, in the process, which was really great to get feedback from kids as well as feedback from lots of really clever friends and um but anyway I was just so so what I noticed when I was reading it to children is that it was really easy for me to say oh what what are your wonders what what have you been wondering um or to notice when if we read some of Winsome's questions notice the children that would go you know, I, I think that, or I'm, I wonder that. So I would hope that maybe it could be a book that 
would add to a teacher's collection of books that um, might be a, a pathway to say, well, what sorts of things are you interested in? And I wouldn't be suggesting that at that moment, the teachers send children off with a KWL chart and say, go write your questions, but rather that it was, please don't do that, everybody, um, but rather that it might be a, a gentle opening to that, that idea that this classroom, this is a place that is a habitat for wonder. This is a place where that, we are going to grow questions together. You're going to bring questions. I'm going to have some questions. We're going to be curious about the world. And so when you have got a, a question, um, this is the place you might put it. You might write it here or you might put it up on our, we might have a wonder wall. Um, I'm, I'm going to try not to get emotional here. I'm going to take a moment just to say, because it's the perfect time, that right now I'm just dedicating this webinar to the memory of the most extraordinary teacher who did just this thing that I'm talking about. Michelle Martin uh, taught grade one up until last Friday where she suddenly uh, died and we lost her. She is one of my greatest allies as a teacher and I really wanted to mention her name today because I'm thinking that many people that I know that are watching this webinar might have seen, I don't think I ever gave a presentation without showing some of Michelle's classroom. And in amongst the slides that I show from her extraordinary classroom over the last 15 years that I've worked with her was a, um, a slide showing what she had, she called them wonder boxes. And they were like, you know, little noodle boxes, those takeaway boxes. And she would lovingly have the children decorate the wonder boxes. And then she'd say to them, you know what, whenever you've got a burning question, even if it's not a burning question, in fact, this year she said, it doesn't have to be burning. If it's a burning question, you can write it on a red bit of paper. If it's just a kind of, yeah, I'm kind of curious, you can put it on one of these really pale colored pieces of paper. And the children would just pop their questions into their wonder boxes. And every so often she'd say, hey, bring your wonder boxes to the carpet. Let's pull a question out and let's all talk about it. So that is one of the many extraordinary things that she did. And I know that had I had the chance, I'm going to go and read this book to her children when I can. But had I had the chance to share this book with her in its final form, that's the kind of thing she would have done afterwards. She would have said, so see those wonder boxes. When you've got a question that you think is really interesting, that you'd like to think or talk or write more about or find out more about, when you're ready, pop it into one of those wonder boxes. And it, pop it into your wonder box. If you'd like me to write the question for you, that's fine. Just come over here and I'll do that. No worries. So I'm going to ask as many teachers in the group that we have today if that idea appeals to you, perhaps you might create something like that, wonder boxes, a wonder wall, a place um, in honour of Michelle in your classrooms in the, the coming year. And uh, let's keep that amazing spirit of curiosity alive. So thank you for allowing me to, to share that. And I did it without crying. Go me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I hope it would be used that way. Yeah. Well, and I think there's such a uh, possibility for being used with teachers as well. I mean, for the, in those exact same ways, but from a school standpoint, mm -hmm. I think we always have to kind of be thinking about this split screen of what are we um, fostering in um, our work with students, uh, mm -hmm. or what do we want students to be doing, what their questions, their wonderings, but how are we doing that? Where are the wonder boxes in our um, faculty room at school, right? Where is it in the principal's office somewhere where we're thinking about what are we wondering about as teachers? Right, and that we should yes. have those kind of those same yes. kinds of questions about. Yeah, and we should be enter, entering classrooms, wondering about things about our students, um, and should be thinking about that across the school too. What are we researching as a school? Yeah. What are we? Yeah. Um, what are we inquiring to? It's just I think very difficult to um, 
foster an inquiring mindset in children if we don't have that as adults. And so I think absolutely, um, I could just as easily see this book being used as a book study with faculty, right? Or as a way of uh, mm -hmm. launching, prompting some of that. Um, what are what are our wonderings about mm -hmm. how children learn? Not even just about individual children. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. I think certainly the schools that I'm lucky enough to work in, we talk a lot about the idea of being, you know, that that notion of a community of inquiry and that we are all inquirers. We're all we're all teachers, we're all learners, you know, kids teachers, we're all we're all learning. Um and I've had a few schools that they've actually created in the staff room. They've created a, a wonder wall in the staff room and, and the teachers have put their questions up that are around what they are currently inquiring into in relation to our, our work as, as educators. Um, I'm thinking of you know, many schools that are doing that. So couldn't agree more. I think that children need to see and hear that the adults that they are interacting with have questions they don't know the answer to and that they are excited and energized by that rather than threatened by it um, that they see their their teachers at, as learners I, I put a a note in the back of the book to the grown-ups um, for that very reason you know be honor your children's curiosity listen to their questions be be a researcher yourself so couldn't agree more I think it the more you're inquiring as a teacher, it's like what we were saying about writing before, you know, if you write, you are a better teacher of writing. If you are, if you inquire, you understand how to support children as inquirers so much better. And, and people and some teachers, um, that can be a, a natural disposition that they bring mm -hmm. and, and but everyone can acquire that disposition and I just wonder um, at the beginning of a school year you know you'll hear so many things about how the time is spent before the kids mm -hmm. come into the building you know what are the meetings they're like pension meetings and new well here in the U.S. new active shooter drill things oh, that God. Will, I know will take up uh, you know my husband's time those four days mm -hmm. before the children enter the building what if there's space made for this to just frame out the year, you know, what, mm. what, what questions and, or what were some of your passion projects over the summer teachers? Um, teachers yeah. are making that small talk as they lug the boxes into their classroom. That is, that's shunted to small talk, but that should be big talk in a building, you know, the, uh, all of oh, that. Nice um, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a beautiful story you shared. Um, you know, and it just connected to that. A teacher, um, I wrote her name down, Rena Vassar. I hope I'm saying it the right way. It's a back, back, back. But one of her questions or her comment was about bringing in family, you know, uh, families into this and, you know, the, the kids having mm. questions at home and inquiring with families. What are some of your, your family wonders? Or um, mm -hmm. so I don't know if you could speak to, have you, um, you know, there's the school community and mm. then there's, the, you know, the immediate surrounding community, the families and. Um, yeah. Yeah. What about bringing them in? Oh, absolutely. You know what? I'm going to mention Michelle again, because one of the things I've got a photo from her classroom a couple of years ago, where one of the things that she and her colleagues did at Elstonwick Primary School early in the year was when they met the the um, child and their families for that first kind of, you know, parent teacher interview thing that we have early in the year. One of the things that she did was ask the parents, hey, what, what are you interested in or passionate about? Or is there something that you would be prepared if our kids got interested in it, you'd be prepared to talk to them about it or come in or be emailed or, and so she, she um, would get, gather some data through those conversations about what experiences and interests the parents had, not just their, you know, not their jobs necessarily. It might have been, but it might have been that they were also, they happened to be really into trains or cooking or whatever. And then she had around the room, if you're interested in animals, you can talk to 
so-and-so's dad and -and so-and-so's mum and then she had their names and she just had this lovely bank of um uh, you know it's sometimes called the human library I love that concept that we create in our school community through our families a human library and you know circling back to writing and the research that accompanies the creation of a piece of writing we often need to go to our human library yeah and and for kids to be able to understand that the teacher is not the only source of information in fact they're they're one small source of information that they've got an entire community whether it's parents or whether it's you know the grade six kid that also is a complete dinosaur you know um nut that that loves dinosaurs and we're we're teaming up the five-year-old that wants to write about dinosaurs with the grade six kid that knows about them as as a resource so and that might be families it might be you know other kids siblings but I think that idea of building seeing the community as a as a human library is a really lovely concept and um, certainly something that Michelle took on and and did beautifully and something I'd really um encourage everyone to do especially at the beginning of the year thank you Kath can I ask just one other I would another one I'm just um always curious about this um so I was thrilled to find out that you didn't illustrate the book it's simply because I would have felt even more inadequate then as not only are you <laughs> writing books for teachers, but you're also writing books for children, which I can't do. Also couldn't begin to illustrate it. So um I but knowing not. you, I also <laughs> but I am but I am curious, but I'm very curious about since again you knew you were making a picture book mm. um and thinking about children's processes, right? I mean, one of the things I care a lot about is the role of illustration, teachers mm. teaching into illustration and the value and role of illustration, especially with young yeah. children. Um, as opposed to sometimes people teaching out of illustration, which it concerns me. Um, I think mm. the role of illustration is crucial in terms of composing meaning. So I'm just curious how you, in your own process and thinking about this, how much did you think about the graphics of this, the illustrations of this, about what this would look like, how much you had winsome pictured in your head, mm-hmm. knew it knowing what she would look like or any of that. I'm just curious um, from how you were thinking through that in creating this. Um, so it was so interesting. I, I've never experienced this process before, actually. So, um, yes, I did have her in my head, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and I actually engaged um, with a young illustrator first up, um, Hillary, who was wonderful and and had lots of great ideas. Um, now, for personal reasons, she couldn't keep going with the project. And then I was left with, uh, and that was one of the moments where I thought, oh, that, right, not, it's not happening, going to put it away. Um, and then just happenstance, really, I happened to be at a um, function and Sharon Matter, who I've known for a long time, and I've known her work for a long time, mm-hmm. I've, known, I've known her, she worked for the, I did used to do some work for Melbourne Zoo and she did a lot of their work and anyway and we were sitting in this group and I just thought oh, Sharon of course it was almost like one of those yes you, you of course you were meant to do it anyway so I tentatively asked her and she said oh well, send it to me and we happened to go into lockdown not long after that so she said well <laughs> sure I've got some time and um, sent me and she said what what about this and she sent me a, a by text at just a, a first go at Winsome and she looked really different to what I, my first brief to Hillary she had wild curly hair red curly hair and that was always in my head and then Sharon sent this with this little bob and I did have a moment where I just went that's not really what she looks like. But then when she, and I was too polite to say, can you make her hair curly? Uh, I just thought, just she's a professional. Let her do her thing. And then when she sent me a few more, it was like, oh, yeah. And now I can't see her any other way. But she added so much. Her, I think her artwork is just beautiful. And I, and and she gets kids, you know, she's, so I I loved that. But I wanted to say that the other 
the other role, and this is something that's interesting for kids too, I think, because we often talk with kids about you write your story or you write and then you illustrate it or someone illustrates it, but we don't think about the designer. So that's a different role. So you can have artwork and you can have words, but what makes what I think really lifts the quality of this is what the designer did. So the designer did the stuff playing with like when the curiosity starts to fade and then the, the colour fades and put all the little um, creatures in the words and did that and chose the colour scheme for the words. So the, um, the work of a designer in concert with an illustrator is really interesting and something we can talk to kids I, I just thought I've never spoken to kids about that I've never I've talked about illustration but the decisions that are made about the placement of words on a page the font the size of the font I haven't done that as much yeah. as I, I'm, I'm certainly going to now yeah because that's such an interesting insight because children have to do all of that when children are young children are creating picture books which is the main thing we do because that's what they see most often yep. right yep. they they're pull they're doing all those things they're the author the illustrator the designer they're making all of those um decisions right but then there's also an interesting avenue in terms of um feedback right in terms of um children yes. talking with each other about their writing and 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 hearing you talk about getting feedback from others as well right mm -hmm. that it's not mm -hmm. an isolated process that it's in conversation with others right yeah and and i think that's something i wanted to say about why it's so powerful to go through this process as a teacher because you you really understand i mean we know this we know writing is not something that people do in isolation well not not in order to get to a finished product mm -hmm. that that writing is a really collaborative there's a lot of collaboration involved and of course you know not it, it's only been a couple of weeks here in australia since kids sat their naplan tests and i was thinking of them sitting there writing about the topic that they've been given in complete silence with a limited time frame, with no opportunity for any feedback or conversation and just how ludicrous it is. It's, it's ludicrous mm -hmm. because the, the, it's not just the conferring, that's the obvious collaboration, but it's, it's, the it's even kind of going, being able to step away from it and then coming back and almost, I wanna say almost collaborating with yourself. You know, this is my, this is what I had a couple of weeks ago and now I'm looking at it and I'm seeing it completely differently. I mean, and every conversation that I had with my peers, not that it was always easy, but every conversation really challenged me and made me rethink the a sentence or a word or a placement of something on the page. Uh, and, and our kids, if we're really putting them in the position of, of being an author, being a writer then we need to give them lots of opportunities to talk with each other to have those not just our one-to-one -one con conferences but to have out those beautiful group conferences when you've got a group of writers gathered together reading their work to each other and giving each other feedback and getting really comfortable with that because it's not easy um i'm a confident writer and i still had moments of this feels scary um so i think I think giving kids that opportunity um, to collaborate. And I love the idea of kids collaborating with each other as author, designer, illustrator, and, and working like that together too, as a, as a, um, a more authentic process. Sure. All right, well, you keep referring to uh, this and I know I, you're Wedding people's appetite for being able to see this, right? So, what do you what do you think, Kath, about um, um, sharing this? I would be happy to. Thank you for okay. asking. I totally to, did not plan it, but I'm. Happy I know to. you do. Oh, me to, I'll... And the back cover with that gorgeous little girl. Hey, guess what? Do you want to hear something really interesting mm -hmm. about what I just read? And there'll be a handful of people that. Are with us that are going um is that the latest version Kath I don't think so because guess what I sent you 
the penultimate version, right. not the ultimate version, which I didn't realize until I was reading it. But I'm going to say that's a good thing because it means then that the recording of the book that we've just made and we'll be putting out into the world isn't the actual book. So there's a few little changes and now you can all be super curious about what was the word that got trashed <laughs> that is still in that version. And you, so there you go. I, did you see I my face that. at one point go, uh, oh no, just keep and, uh, I worried. I worried about that because I knew it wasn't the <laughs> final version, but I wasn't sure how close I was hoping it was close enough. I just thought it'd be easier if I pulled it up. Um, but <laughs> but that people need to figure out what all the differences are. You did a little inquiry project right there. There um, are a few. Stuff. There so, are a few. <laughs> um, how, how, would, how do people um, get this book? Um, so here in Australia, um, John Reed publishers, uh, sorry, distributors, uh, you can get it direct from them. And uh, overseas, Follett, um, which many teachers will know, Follett is um, stocking it there. So I've got links right. on my website. You can buy it from my website too, but it's way too expensive to send. So better to go with one of those. Okay. That's not because it's expensive. That. It's the postage. It's not me. Yeah, no, I know how that, <laughs> but, how and, how it, that it and it's a bit heavy because it's a hard copy. So it's it's heavy. You learn stuff about how much paper weighs and <laughs> right. So yeah. So beautiful. Um, Thank you so yeah. much. Oh, that's oh my, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for asking me to read read it. And look, uh, you know, my my hope is that out of our conversation, which we'll need to to wind up, but. Uh, out of our conversation, I really hope that there are some things that um, the teachers present with us um, are taking away to think about in terms of how they support their young children as, as writers and the importance of honouring that curiosity and that that curiosity in itself is the seed for, for writing and to be curious about about the writing process to engage in it and find it in itself fascinating to notice with children wow isn't this interesting how we've spent half an hour on one sentence here you know wow what's that telling us about writing or whatever it might be just bring that stance to to writing it's it's you know it's not a color by numbers process it's it's there's no recipe for it and and the other thing I, I think that I want to say is that I think as a writer, knowing what it feels like to follow through something that is important to me that I care about, um, I want kids to have that feeling. So giving your children choice, I, I, you know, when I hear things like, oh, we give kids a choice about what to write on a Friday, it's Freaky Friday, as if it's freaky to have a choice. There's nothing freaky about it, sorry, just can't cope um i'm not saying that there aren't times where we are deliberately writing with a you know with a given purpose together but but if our kids don't have the opportunity to experience choice um then we're taking away a really significant part of what it means to write and what drives you as a writer and what drives any creative um endeavor yeah, and to have that just, valued, and to have that choice valued by teachers and be central to the classroom, not an yes. extra add-on mm -hmm. thing. Not not a special thing that you get to do if right. you've got everything else done. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Kathy, yeah. Matt, Kath, do you need to say anything more? No, I just want to say Kathy and Matt have gotten up in the middle of the night. I think the sun has risen during our time. <laughs> I can see it. So I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am. I have such respect for both of you as educators, as supporters of teachers and children. I've learned so much from talking with you, from reading. If others that are watching this don't know of the the work of of Kathy and Matt then get on it 
um, because it's really great and it all, you know, it all ties beautifully together in this this big, warm, fuzzy inquiry family that we have. Um, and, and I also want to thank, of course, everyone who's given an hour of their time uh, to us. And um, and I, it feels a bit indulgent. I, I they Both <laughs> Chanel and Kathy and Matt know that I felt a bit weird. Australians aren't very good at the look what I did thing, <laughs> but, um, but I am very grateful uh, that, that people have been part of it. And um, if it means that we, yeah, that we do honour our kids' curiosity just a little more, then it'll have been worth the weird feeling. Thank you. thank you so much. No, thank you for the opportunity to share in this. I really appreciate it. No worries. It's Thanks a, again, such Chanel. It's a pleasure to be in everyone's company. Chanel, thank you so much. No, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you all for being here. As Kat said, Matt and Kathy, you, you get up at the weirdest hours for me. So thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Kat, for giving, the, giving me the opportunity of doing this for you. So thank no. you. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day, afternoon, night, whatever. <laughs>